Okay, let's talk uh, for a few minutes about Fats Waller. There's a bunch of pictures here in front of us. It's all black and white mostly. Now, one of the things amazing, if you ever watch Fats Waller play, watch his left hand and his right hand because they're often moving in dramatically different ways. And so sometimes he's working slide, but um, it's just fun to watch him play. And that's partially what he's famous for is that, um, is that mugging he was doing all the time. I don't know why Al Capone's picture is right there, but um, but let me get to the text of um, of Powerhouse now. So the the te the story takes place uh, in a town that's segregated, and it's a white crowd listening to black mu uh, musicians, and um, it's not Fats Waller; it's Powerhouse. But the story goes that um, Eudora Welty got to see Fats Waller. Um, perform and she was uh, amazed and captivated by it and so the next day she sat down this story um so uh we don't take him exactly as um fat swaller but we do um you know we, we learn some things from it now part of what i want to say is that this story has a very simple narrative if you just count they perform some songs they take a break they walk down the street and they meet some people, um, you know, in the other side of town. And that's mostly what happens in the story. Um, there are details along the way, of course, but it, it, the story is the texture of the story. The rhythms and the sounds and things are, are generally considered more important than the, than the plot of this story, right? So um, I want to point out some of that kind of stuff. So uh, I pull... Well, let me go to the beginning of the story, and then I'll come back to a page that I like to try to show you something. But... What we're talking about here is jazz. Now, I've mentioned before that jazz was important to a lot of the writers, uh, and important to a lot of Americans. It was pretty obvious um, that something very special was being created. One way we talk about jazz is to talk about what it was born out of. Um, and of course, the instruments are sometimes long, long traditional instruments, so it's not radical in that way exactly. But um, Music was generally perform, performed to a, a, a regular count, and um, generally you had the group playing together in a coordinated way, right? And nobody, no one single instrument usually just simply uh, took off and, and did something different. Now, you could have a symphony, of course, where one instrument or a couple instruments are, are featured for a while, but what jazz brought to this first and foremost was syncopation and that, and that means the changing of the rhythms or the making it uh irregular uh so instead of going one two three four five six seven eight in a metronomic way you can go one two three four five six seven eight and you might end up counting eight at the same you know time but uh but things were played with in between, basically, is one way to think about this, right? So first there's syncopation. Then there's uh, the impromptu nature of a lot of jazz. Uh, the prompt, impromptu in the sense that um, you have uh, improvisation. And the group itself could be imp improvising on, on some through line that maybe is fairly easy to understand. But, um, but what they're doing with it um, might be different tonight compared to tomorrow night and the night after that. That's part of the improvisation, right? But along with that, the improvisation came um, uh, focuses on solos, where one instrument plays for a little while, and sometimes it recedes then back into the group, maybe another instrument, right? So this story by Welty is doing something like that, right? Uh, we know that Powerhouse has more than one band member playing more than one instrument, but the story counts them. And, and has us pay attention to them, partially by having um, uh, Powerhouse speak directly to them, okay? And and he's doing it in a way that is a, is a classic of um, African-American literature, and that's the call and response. So, so Powerhouse will call directly to a member, but we have to realize part of what's happening there, if we were actually listening to the musical instruments, is one musical instrument, the way it's played, might call to another, or, or sit back and let another answer in a way, right? So call and response is, um, you can find this in black churches. You can find it um, 
uh, in all kinds of places, right? But, but Welty built it into this particular story. So a simple kind of call and response that people have heard of before is if somebody in church says, you know, can I get an amen? Maybe the preacher says that, right? And then people in the crowd say, amen. And that's the call and then the response to it, right? So uh, look for that. It's a kind of dialogue and sometimes um, uh, complicated dialogue uh, with with one group or one person or something calling to another group of person. And sometimes it's very formal. Uh, you have a simple conversation between two people, right? Let's say, um, but sometimes it's um, it's complicated and flows and moves around, and that's what's happening in the powerhouse, right? So, if we go to the first paragraphs here, we have powerhouse is playing. He's here on tour from the city powerhouse and his keyboard powerhouse and his Tasmanians. Think of the things he calls himself. There's no one in the world like him. You can't tell what he is, nigger man. He looks more Asiatic, monkey, Jewish. Babylonian, Peruvian, fanatic, devil. He has pale gray eyes, heavy lids, maybe horny like a lizard's, but big glowing eyes when they're open. He has African feet of the greatest size, stomping both together on each side of the pedals. He's not coal black, beverage colored. Looks like a preacher when his mouth is shut, but then it opens vast and obscene, and his mouth is going every minute, like a monkey's when it looks for something improvising coming on a light and childish melody smooch he loves it with his mouth now one thing we notice um from our vantage point in the 21st century right is that wealthy this right white writer is um is uh taking liberties in a way right so she's using the n-word in here she's uh asking whether this person uh looks like a monkey or more Asiatic or what it is, right? So those are tropes that are very obvious, famous tropes um, that have been used um, to the denigration of black people, of African-Americans, right? So it would be, you'd, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who would, uh, a, a responsible writer who would pull out something like, you know, asking whether this black character looks like a monkey or something, right? Um, we don't usually sort of, take issue with this too much, right? It might be partially because the story isn't that famous, right? But this is partially because of our respect for the writer, Welty, that even though she is pulling on some some tropes in a way, right, we we get a strong sense that she's, uh, this, this character who's writing this is affectionate. And um, especially if we know Fats Waller and the way he sort of begs to be paid attention to and stuff, um, uh, I think it makes a kind of sense that, that well, it, it makes it a little less likely that somebody's going to say, oh, I think she doesn't know what she's talking about. She's ignorant. She's racist. That's why she's pulling this stuff together. Um, I don't, I think most of us don't feel that's what she's doing there, right? But it does make it dangerous, doesn't it? That, that she's right in there and asking, what does this mean? She's also posing to some degree as a, a white ear or what we sometimes call the white gaze, in the sense that um, that the narrator here doesn't fully understand what she's seeing or what he's seeing. It isn't really a gendered narrator, right? But um, the fact that, that, the, that the narrator seems to be in the room suggests that the narrator is white. Okay, so it's watching um, uh, Powerhouse and his keyboard and his Tasmanians and doesn't exactly know what to make of everything, right? So now the story continues. And one thing that's always fun for me is when my students comment on this, uh, they often um, take very seriously what Powerhouse is going to say about his wife and, and the, the drama uh, that comes from back home, right? And I don't think we're supposed to take it that seriously, right? Now, I'm pulling down um, farther into our printing, right? And uh, uh, let me start here on the left side just to set this up, right? Late at night, they play the one waltz they will ever consent to play by request. Pagan love song. Powerhouse's head rolls and sinks like a weight between his waving shoulders. He groans and his fingers drag into the keys heavily, holding on to the notes, retrieving. It is a sad song. Now, the reference to it being a waltz is to some degree slow and a slow dance song. And um, I, I think it's it's a 
in some sense, it's a low energy song. So Powerhouse is not going to fill his setup with that, right? But um, but he plays this. Now, by introducing the song that way, Welty's narrator then leads to this conversation that happens between the members of the band. So I've highlighted them in these different colors. And, and I'm not really a great reader doing this, but I want to try to show you, I think, what's happening. Um, in yellow, it's going to be Powerhouse's voice. And then there's three other people that end up speaking and sometimes we know who it is, but sometimes we don't exactly know. Uh, most traditionally, when you write a story, you make it clear who speaks every sentence, right? So whether you say like, you know, uh-huh, powerhouse said, something like that, right? Um, but this story doesn't do that. And, and sometimes we can figure out because there's a clue, like to the type of person. So Scoot, for example, is, is a, a more unwelcome person. Valentine is so laid back and everything, right? So they end up with these different voices. And I think what Welty is doing to some degree is she's she's letting these voices be instruments, okay? So they, they work in a kind of harmony and they speak to each other, okay, with Powerhouse's lead. So when these men respond to Powerhouse's story, I think what we have is something like a, a metaphor of instruments responding, um, you know, the, and, and the... the the lines that people are playing, the melody that somebody works out, right? So I'm going to try to sort of read this and see if I can do it, right? So we're on the, the left side right there. You know what happened to me, says Powerhouse. Valentine hums a response, dreaming at the base. I got a telegram. My wife is dead, says Powerhouse with wandering fingers. Uh-huh. His mouth gathers and forms a barbarous O while his fingers walk up straight unwillingly three octaves. Gypsy? Why how come her to die? Didn't you just phone her up in the night last night, long distance? Telegram say, hear the words, your wife is dead. He puts 4-4 four, four over the 3-4. Not before words, this is the drummer, an unpopular boy named Scoot, a disbelieving maniac. Powerhouse is shaking his vast cheeks. What the hell was she trying to do? What was she up to? What name has it got signed if you got a telegram? Scoot is spitting away with those wire brushes. Little brother, the clarinet player who cannot now speak, glares and tilts back. Uranus Knockwood is the name signed. Powerhouse lifts his eyes open. Ever heard of him? A bubble shoots out on his lip like a plate on a counter. Valentine is beating slowly on with his palm and scratching the strings with his long blue nails. He is fond of a waltz. Powerhouse interrupts him. I don't know him. Valentine sit, shakes his head with the closed eyes. Say it again. Uranus Knockwood. Well, that ain't Lennox Avenue. It ain't Broadway. Ain't ever seen it wrote in any print, even for horse racing. Hell, that's on a star, boy, ain't it? Crash of the cymbals. What the hell is she up to, powerhouse shutters? Tell me, tell me, tell me. He makes triplets and begins a new chorus. He holds three fingers up. You say you got it in a telegram? This is Valentine, patient and sleepy, beginning again. Powerhouse is elaborate. Yes, the time I go out, go way downstairs along a long coal reed door to where they puts it. Coming back along the coal reed door, steps out and hands me a telegram. Your wife is dead. Gypsy? The drummer like a spider over his drums. Ah, shouts Powerhouse, flinging out both powerful arms for three whole beats to flex his muscles, then kneading a dough of bass notes. His eyes glitter. He plays the piano like a drum sometimes. Why not? Gypsy, such a dancer? Why you don't hear it straight from your agent? Why it ain't come from headquarters? What you been doing getting telegrams in the corridor signed nobody? They all laugh. End of that course. What time is it, Powerhouse called? What the hell place is this? Where is my watch and chain? Now hang it on you, whimpers Valentine. It's still there. There it rides on Powerhouse's great stomach, down where he can never see it. Sure did hear some clock striking 12 while ago. Must be midnight. They're going to be in remission, Powerhouse declares, lifting um, with the signet ring. He draws the chorus to an end. He pulls a big northern hotel towel out of the deep pocket in his vast special cut tux pants and pushes his forehead into it. If she went and killed herself, he says with a hidden face, if she up and jumped out that window, he gets to his feet, turning vaguely, wearing the towel on his head. Aw, uh ha. -huh. Sheik, sheik. She wouldn't do that. Little brother sets down his clarinet like a precious vase and speaks. 
He still looks like an East Indian queen, implacable, divine, and full of snakes. They ain't going to expect people doing what they say is over long distance. So could you hear a little bit? You know, I'm trying to like emphasize that the, these guys speak in different voices. But if we were watching them play, we would know that the voices are, you know, as a clarinet, it's a bass guitar, uh, or actually could be a, a bass violin, right? And, um, you know, uh, Powerhouse himself is on the piano, right? So that's a way they talk to each other, right? Um, I think it's it's interesting that when they take the break, they walk down the street, right? So lots of towns in the United States then would have had um, uh, parts of the town nicknamed, right? So sometimes you might have heard somebody say something like, well, dark town's over there, meaning the black folks in the town are going to live, you know, on that side or in that area. Um, and th things like that were common and names that were a little bit like that, right? Well, these guys, they... They're in a situation where now not every town was the same in the United States, but they're in a situation where they might not be welcome to stay where they're at and try to get anything to eat. Um, so many places, for example, if you were black, they might serve you out the back door, but some places didn't serve anybody who's black. Um, so, but what they do in this story is something that would be very typical, and that's that they walk down to a section of town where, um, you know, they'll get served and they're going to meet more black people are going to be there. And, and, you know, some people over time, some older people have said that there were some good things about that segregated time because um, it was really clear. You stay over there, you can be, you know, with people who are going to treat you right because they're your own people and stuff. Right. But it's, it had to be an absolutely mixed situation all the time. Right. In the story though, they go down um to the black section of town and they put some nickels in and and they want to um, uh, hear some songs themselves. Uh, he calls it, the, it says, Valentine and Scoot take the money over to the Nickelodeon. Now, that isn't the same thing as a Nickelodeon like a movie playing machine. Or Well, actually, Nickelodeon was a place where they had several machines that cost a nickel. And, you know, you might pay a nickel just to get in and play the, the movie machines. This is different. It's basically a jukebox, right? So um, I like this part because uh, Eudora Wealthy gets to work in some music. Um, she shows some degree what she knows herself, right? But it's also a way to give a shout out to other people, right? Which is also a really common thing in a lot of black literatures is, is working in a... Um, a countdown or a roll call, basically, right? So Valentine Scoot take the money over to the Nickelodeon, which looks as battered as a slot machine, and read all the names of the records out loud. Who's Tuxedo Junction? Asked Powerhouse. You know who's Nickelodeon. I request you please to play Empty Bed Blues and let Bessie Smith sing. So Bessie Smith is a she's somewhat earlier than than Fats Waller, and um, she's the grand dam of um of blues music so i mean there's a lot of overlap between blues and jazz there's even some overlap between um um the earlier piano playing which was ragtime and jazz and then there's blues and so there is overlap with all of those things but there's also to some degree a, a historical um sequence in them right so we think of ragtime being earlier and then jazz and the blues never neither one of them ever died or anything right but but over time you learn the names of the people that influenced other people so um bessie smith became a giant but bessie smith actually followed ma rainey so um over time you pull those out but but this is a kind of notice where um you know powerhouse is playing in the town but there's black music uh wherever you drive and uh, that would have also been in 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 some places in white sections of town too there there was a lot of racism directed at people sometimes for even appreciating things that were black um, uh, as in, you know, art forms and stuff like that. And, and there's a lot of attacking to, you know, against people, you know, and you're not allowed to enjoy that sort of thing. Right. Um, in this case though, they're down and, uh, and uh, they're playing things uh, with a black group of people and from a jukebox got black, you know, uh, artists and stuff. Right. So, let me move to keep going on this, right? Now, um, that's apparently a made-up story about Uranus Knockwood. And um, it's just part of the entertainment. It's part of the, the conversation going on with these guys that, that the white crowd probably doesn't really understand. 
and um, they might just see it as a strange, exotic thing. So that's part of what the story is pointing out, is that this mysterious and strange and exotic quality is partially what the white crowd wants to see. There's some disappointment, though, especially from, you know, Powerhouse and the boys in the sense that, you know, the white crowd is not going to be responding um, as as knowingly as, you know, as a black crowd would. And, and they're not going to, well, the stereotype is they're not going to um, be as emotive. They're not going to um, be as demonstrative of their appreciation or their dancing or anything else, right? Now, I want to read a section of something that I wrote back in graduate school. Um, I had a professor who knew a lot about jazz when I knew very little at that time. And um, so he gave us a great sort of inspiration on this, but I know we had to go home one weekend and, and write, and I didn't know anything about Powerhouse. And uh, I just knew I had to write something and present it to the class and, and something grabbed on to me. I was inspired sort of by the story. And so I, I wrote something kind of creative, but I really took it into class that day, copies for everybody, and really wondered whether I'd just done something really stupid. Um, but I took the chance, and I'm glad I did. But w what I did was wrote something that's kind of a, a creative type of criticism. And part of why I did it was that professor had introduced me to the idea that um, uh, some artists believe the very best commentary on art is only done by other artists, meaning anytime somebody puts together something artistically, they are commenting, they're reacting, and making a comment on what came before. So in the sense that, like, you know, we normally want sober essays of criticism and stuff, right? But but there may be other ways to comment on the stuff that, that it come before came before, right? So this is a piece of... Uh, of what I wrote and turned in. And it turned out, it turned pretty positive. I know some students just didn't say anything. I don't know if it made any sense to them, but a couple students really sort of liked it, right? Um, um, but let me read a piece of it. It's called The Story of the Greatest Size, Powerhouse and His Tasmanians, Music and Lyrics by Eudora Welty. Join the band, play with the band, put the adverb on the adjective on the noun, take one back if you like, put four, four over the three, four, Open the door to the coal reed door. Sentence frag. Triple it. Sentence frag. Frag, frag, frag. Pagan love song. Join the band. Play with the band. Play with the words like Welty, like Powerhouse. Yeah. -ha. I remember listening to Coltrane's Love Supreme while reading a passage of Kerouac. John was celebrating God. Jack was celebrating God also. A jazz band digging their sound. There was love and lust in the passage, like Capote put over Brando's Kowalski, like the Babe put over a fastball, like Eudora Welty put over Fats Waller. A powerhouse is constructed when it's done right. Welty does it right, not capturing, not mimicking, but digging and riding along with love and lust of another medium. We love jazz for its motion, the way structure and freedom share the stage. Sibylic, foresight, and manic improvisation sharing the stage powerhouse only plays one waltz he only tells one story but if he only had a nickel if he only had a nickel for every spin he could turn when powerhouse invents he thrills when he repeats or reinvents or invents anew he is playing jazz and telling story he doesn't tell it complete he makes no claim to tell it true it is indeterminate indefinite electric and exquisite a moment in spotlight a hybrid of reality and dream world Powerhouse is Welty's demonic twin, her secret sharer. Like she, he performs at the keyboard. They have as much as possible done by signals. They invent their own world. The young white woman off the side of the crowd, Welty's stand-in narrator tells us how to listen. Learn what it is? What is it? Listen. Remember how it was with the acrobats? Watch them carefully, hear the least word, especially what they say to one another in another language. Don't let them escape you. It's the only time for hallucination. Hear the words of the acrobat, the words of the piano player. Welty and Powerhouse controlled the words, signifying something for the listener's pleasure. The reader's response. They are the acrobats. Welty writes a set of rhythmic kicks against the floor to communicate the tempo. She gives Powerhouse the beat. He passes it on to the boys. Powerhouse is not a show-off. He's in a trance. He's a person of joy, a fanatic. 
just like his partner, the visceral, toe-tapping, ebullient young writer named Eudora, who watched Fats Waller then sat down directly, knock wood, to join and create Powerhouse at the keyboard. Sometimes, together, they even played the piano like a drum. Why not? Beer? Beer? You know what beer is? What do they say is beer? What's beer? Where I been? Yaha! There's a million nickels, says Powerhouse, the Negro, the band leader. He would play the same way for an audience of one, but he don't carry around nothing without limit. Maybe a million is the limit. No, stop. He made one vanish. All but the last one, which he makes vanish. He's got a million less one song to give out, or a million versions of the same song. Gypsy song. Gypsy, Sybil, Uranus, knock on wood. Powerhouse is real and unreal, fantasy and reality. Welty refuses to cage him, refuses to close her celebration. She has voiced her discomfort with critics. Analysis has to travel backward on an ever-narrowing path, whereas story writers work into the open. Maybe Gypsy cheated. Maybe Gypsy jumped. Gypsy sure as hell jumps when Powerhouse plays, and that's enough too much. He makes a scream delicately with bumping pleasure. His mouth is vast and obscene. He has African feet of the greatest size. Now, can you see how strange that was? And, you know, I didn't really know what was going to happen. But um, but uh, that professor had, you know, I had already showed him that I could work in a traditional way. And I got really good grades and stuff. So um, even if you know, I thought, well, if he fails me on this assignment, I'll still survive. But um. I know I had fun writing that too, but I was trying to, to do what she did. So he, she puts fiction on top of uh, his musical playing. And I was trying to put commentary or criticism on top of her fiction writing, sort of in a way. And so, in other words, where she's taking um, creative leaps writing fiction, I'm trying to take creative leaps in the, in the commentary. So, um, yeah, but it's not like, I write that all the time and people publish it. So uh, so I hope in a way you might like it, especially if you know some about uh, jazz and music and, and get that idea of improvisation too, right? Okay, so talk to you later.